Okay. Uh, we're kind of short everybody tonight. Jerry's not going to be here. He is home having some uh, stomach problems. Jared's not here. Kay's not here. Robbie's not here. So here's your choice. We can jump right into this and get done quick. Or one of you can stand up and volunteer and sing. Yeah, I'm up here already. Go ahead. I get it. I see how it is. Um, you guys, a uh, couple of things I'm going to ask you real quick is uh, keep keep Miss Margaret in your in your prayers uh, this week. And uh, last year was the anniversary for Andy's passing, and then. Uh, also, Tom and Lois Cass, this is the anniversary of Diane's death also. You remember one was one week, one was the next week. It's just, it's just a very difficult time for, for both families, so keep them in, uh, in your prayers uh, through this time. Then uh, remember our seat at the pole this week uh, will be, and I'm not sure what schools are doing what time. Uh, check the local schools and, and find out. And then after they have to see you after the poll, nobody has contacted me on that, so I'm guessing uh, I'll find out probably Wednesday night when I get here who's here and who's not. Uh, Thursday, right? Thursday, Ephesians 5, Ladies Bible Study at uh, Sue Patterson's house. Uh, Marion, I'm going to extend an invitation for you to go to that uh, with our ladies. They meet up here 1230, 1240. Uh, go and have a good uh, time of Bible study. And Sue not only fills them with the Word, she uh, fills them with some type of snack and food. And, and they bring it home to me. And my blood sugar does not always support it well. That cinnamon roll was the bomb. Wow, it was good. It didn't make it till coffee the next morning, okay? I'm sorry. It's just one of those uh, those things that's there. Uh, be in prayer for our missions offering for the uh, month of September. Uh, we'll bring you up to date on where we're at on that uh, next week. And that's about, oh, the night to shine next Sunday night if you have a talent and... I say a talent. If you have something you'd like to share with the church, we want to give you that opportunity. Right now, four have signed up, and I told a couple of our kids at the pool party yesterday, I said, the more that sign up, that means the less I get to preach. So they decided they were going to get more people to uh, sign up. I don't know how that's, that's going right now, but it is what it is. Good to have our director of missions with us and his wife, Ronnie and Marion. I got to ask you now, Mary, and I asked Kim, but I'm going to ask you because you're going to know the right answer. How is the unpacking going? It's going great. Are you there yet? No, we still have some boxes in the garage, but it's mm -hmm. really going very well. Well, that's what he said, but sometimes a man's perspective <laughs> and a woman's is, well, in my house, they're always night and day different. <laughs> and uh, uh, I did nothing wrong. He's just here visiting, I hope. <laughs> well, We'll find out in a little bit. Remember the association meeting coming up on the 10th? Uh, I believe that's three weeks away. Okay. Put that on your calendar. All right. If you have your Bibles tonight, I want you to turn to Romans chapter 8. Caleb had his argument. I was just getting ready to say that while you're turning. Caleb Martin has his uh, gallbladder surgery tomorrow. It's supposed to report at 8 o'clock, surgery at 9. Hopefully he'll be home by noon. He'll be in McAllister. Is that right, Linda? Hey, as long as he gets to come home, that's the main thing. Anyway, be in, be in prayer for those. Okay, what does it mean to be in Christ? What does it mean to be in Christ? I was sharing with you two weeks, three weeks ago, actually, Dr. Vines had mentioned three things about being in Christ. The first 13 verses, he tells us it, being in Christ means there's no condemnation. No condemnation. When we look at the first verse of that, of, of Romans 8, he says, There is therefore no condemnation to those 
who are in Christ Jesus. With that, no condemnation that is there. It gives us encouragement, assurance as a believer that our spiritual liberation is that of having no condemnation because of our protection when we are in Christ. We, we are not condemned because of our position being in Christ. Because of our power, he tells us in verse 2, uh, for the law of the spirit of the life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. On the one hand, the law of the spirit frees us. On the other hand, the law of sin and death fetters us far away in distances us from Christ because through the law and that law would have been the Mosaic law we find that there's no one that can keep that law none that is perfect no not one and then we see because of our potential we're weak through the flesh while the law can show our sin it cannot save us the power to live the holy lives only comes being in Christ. We see that in verses 3 and 4. But then we look, the, the last week we looked, being in Christ means no cancellation, no condemnation, no cancellation. Because of the promises that we have. In verse 14 we have the promise of God's guidance. Verse 15 and 16 the promise of acceptance. God's acceptance. And then finally we have the promise of of problems in verse 17. And I know that's one we look at and we're going to go, well, that's just real exciting. We have a promise of problems. Yeah, there's going to be difficulties that's going to come. We have some today that want to say, all you have to do is accept Jesus and your life's going to be great. I will tell you, your life will get tough. Maybe even more complicated as it seems, but we have a hope that is there. And he tells us, if heirs... Or if children, then heirs and heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may be glorified with him. Now, the thing to remember is it doesn't say you're going to suffer. It says we suffer with him. With him. Why? Because we are in Christ. What overtook Christ? You're going to say death. No. Jesus submitted willingly to death, even death on the cross. They did not kill him. He gave himself. And with that, when, when, when the opposition comes, when the trouble comes, when the problems come, it's not that we're going to jump up and down with joy and say, oh boy, here's another time. Nobody welcomes that. But we have a promise that as an heir, a son, we have part of that inheritance. God will be right there with us. I'll never leave you, never forsake you. Greater is he that's in you than is in the world. We are more than conquerors, and, and we'll see that in just a little while. All of those promises are there. And the problems are going to be, listen, you can't live a life as a believer or a non-believer and not have problems. You're going to have them. You go look at non-believers, and you're going to say in your life, you know, since I've accepted Christ, it seems like there's been more problems. Look around really close at other people that are out there. And you will see they struggle also. But the big difference is you struggle with the hope that you have in Jesus Christ. They struggle and have no hope that is there. So we have no condemnation, no cancellation. And I love the one this evening. No separation. No separation. Let's read verses 28 uh, to 39. And we know that all things work together for the good to those who love the Lord, to those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he may be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he called. Whom he called, these he justified. And these he justified, he also glorified. In what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be as against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Is the, or it is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? 
It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us. Who will separate us? Now, some translations are going to say, what shall separate us? But who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long? We are counted as sheep for the slaughter, quoting Psalm 44, 22. But he goes on and, and, and he finishes this and says, Yet in all of these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, angels or principalities, nor powers nor things present nor things to come, nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus Amen. our Lord. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for tonight. I thank you for the ones that are gathered here to hear your word. And may we find, God, may we find tonight great comfort. May we find direction. May we find assurance in these verses, knowing that being in Christ means no separation. Open our hearts and minds that we may hear, that we may see, that we may know. And Father, for these that we mentioned in prayer, for Margaret, for Tom, for Lois at this difficult time of the year. For Caleb as he goes into surgery tomorrow. Lord, that they may realize also what it means to be in Christ. Even though they're not here, may they, they experience the very things that we read about, that I preach about, that you have given us. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. We ask these things in your name. Amen. You know... Paul rhetorically asks the question in verse 35, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? When I think about that, I ponder for a minute. I ponder because this is one of my security passages that I, I preach, that I teach. What do I mean by security passages? That, that we're gods. When you, when you have made that decision. Ephesians says you're sealed. Mm -hmm. Hebrews tells you even if you could fall away, it is impossible for you to renew once again after you've tasted, after you've experienced. John says once we have been placed in the Father's hand, nothing can snatch us out. So we ask the question, what does it mean to be in Christ Jesus? We live in a world today where I would say a word that would describe our society more than anything else is abandonment. Abandonment. We hear of children being abandoned. We hear of relationships being abandoned. Where fathers leave, mothers leave. We hear where people leave work with no notice. We live in an abandoning a society. There is, there, there is not here today what was there in, in, I just hate to say this, but I can remember 40 years ago what it was, and we're not there. When I took wedding vows in 1982, I held them very dear, and I learned very quickly what it meant when it said, till death do us part. Jill and I took our vows. We're stuck. We may live on different sides of the house. No. We are committed to each other for life. I was visiting with a lady that's taking care of her husband. She also has the responsibility of raising two great grandbabies. They're not grandbabies, but, but, but grandkids. And her, her husband has a lot of health needs and requires her attention. And those girls, the family that's there, are watching her. And I made a comment, because it's hard, and she expressed difficulty. And I said, but I want you to think about this. Look at the testimony you're giving those girls. They know you're raising them because of an abandonment. 
and, and men traping in and out and in and out of a house and different relationships that are there. You're teaching them what it means till death do you part. What it means to take care of. So I say all that because being in Christ means there is no separation. No separation. So what can separate us? Nothing. Nothing. And, and, and let, me, let me share three things with you that, that having not that no separation means. Number one is, as believers, we can rest in God's promise. I love verse 28. A lot of us have it memorized. And we know that all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord, those who are called according to his purpose. How can personal tragedies be considered as good? You didn't read the verse. If you're saying that, you're not reading the verse. God causes all things to work together for good. Not all the things that happen are good, but God can take the situation, the circumstance, the problem, the trouble, and can work it toward the good. His good. His understanding. In addition to all these things that do not work together for good, we can see the good is not what caused, but the good is the outcome. The outcome. Tomorrow's Brother Ralph Carpenter's home-going service. I, I find it hard to say that, that, that he passed, he died, and I know he did. But I know where Ralph's at. Some of you have known Ralph way longer than I have. I've known him since 1996. I got straightened out yesterday, Greta, because I was, I, I said, Ralph, when he found out I was looking for a church, he called you up, and the individual said, no. Larry Moore said he called me, and I called Greta. But Ralph is, is the one that's responsible for getting me down here in this area. So if you're unhappy, it's too late to take it up with him. But, but Ralph, and Ralph wasn't perfect, but Ralph was a good guy. Ralph loved the Lord, and he didn't mind telling. And in the last couple of years, Ralph has had a real hard time. And I know where he's at. And, and, and when his wife passed five years ago, six years ago, there's a big part of him that passed with it. Those two were a team. And you know, when I look at the sadness that's there, I look at the outcome. What does Paul say about death? Being absent in the body is present, present with the Lord. And I know where he's at. I know where he's at. You know, sometimes we have to see the problems that come so we can see the blessings that we already have. Sometimes we're like those... I read, was reading this this morning in Dr. Wearsby's study Bible with the Israelites making the way the, the former generation has passed away and, and, and we're in Deuteronomy and Moses is reading to the new generation the law and giving all the commands and, and, and Dr. Wearsby in his introduction to Deuteronomy was, was telling one of the things that had happened is, is yes, the former generation was a stiff-necked, hard-hearted generation. They grumbled all the time. They, they're just nothing could make them happy and said, you know, they had forgotten when they got to Kadesh Barnea to go in to take the promised land. They had forgotten all that God had done for them. Last week we looked at Joshua in the morning service and Joshua leading them in, but Joshua was with that first generation. He was that generation. And, and they had forgotten. All they could see was giants. There's this big fruit because big giants eat that fruit. That's why, remember? So when, we, when they looked at that, they had forgotten about ten plagues. They had forgotten about the crossing of the Red Sea on dry ground and collapsing upon the Egyptian army. They had forgotten about water coming from the rock that sped two, three, four million people. They had forgotten about 
the manna that God had provided for them. They had forgotten about all these other things. Matter of fact, they got so accustomed to the manna, it grew old to them. We're sick of this manna. Oh, that we could have the leeks and the, and the vegetables from Egypt. If we could just go back there instead of being in the desert. And they miss the blessing. Sometimes things happen to remind us of the blessings that we have. And what God has done for this. This, this verse that we look at in, 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 in verse 28, all things. We know all, th all things work together for the good. Not all things are good. As believers, we know that. That's something that non-believers cannot understand. This verse makes sense to us, but Paul puts it, we know. Of course, the only way we know, though, is through trust. Is through trust trust. And is that not what it means to be in Christ? We have to trust Him. You know, I, I, I look back at some of the Old Testament characters. Elijah fighting or, or bat, battling, dueling with the prophets on Mount Carmel. Don't you know when he built that altar and he stood up and prayed? Don't you, you gotta wonder, was he sweating bullets for a minute there? Was he? What, 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 what about, uh, you look at, at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Even if, they told Nebuchadnezzar, even if we die, our God will deliver us. You know what? They, they saw what the Apostle Paul, for me to live is one thing, to die is another. If I live, it's great. And they said, you know, if our God chooses not to deliver us, so be it. And you got to wonder when they're walking up to that fiery furnace and the guards around them are like, poof, becoming a candle, and they fall into the fire, and they're walking around. But you got to wonder as they're walking up there, what's going through the, that absolute trust that is there. When they were getting ready to throw Daniel in the lion's den, Daniel knew if he went to his house and prayed that day, he would go stand before the king. He knew it. But it did not matter. Of fact, it said he went and opened the windows. And doing that, he allowed everybody to see in. All he had to do was shut those curtains, put those, whatever it was, covering the window, and they would have never known. Oh, no, he makes sure they're open so they know. What about Esther when she went before the king? Wonder how she felt. Well, I do believe it's raining outside. Maybe we ought to do a happy dance. I can say my preaching brought the rain. No, we won't go that far. But, but I want you to see, when you even look at the New Testament, here's John, an old man, and he's in exile, thinking, I will never get off this island alive. And then what happens in the midst of all of that? He has the revelation from God. What about Peter when he's in jail knowing the next day he's going to be like James. He's going to lose his head. The angel smote him on the side and said, get your clothes and come on. And he thought it was a vision following out. It wasn't until the gate closed and he thought, wow, this is real. And he went. What about the apostle Paul and the many trials that he went to and through? So we see that only a believer can experience this because we have to have the trust. Pardon the old cliche and not, not necessarily scriptural, but if he brings you to it, he'll take you through it. No separation. It means we have rest in God. And you know, I, I like that. We can rest. We don't have to worry about it. God's got this. But secondly... As believers, we can rejoice in God's plan. And believe it or not, God has got a plan for all of this. This isn't just something happen chance and something happens and God's wringing his hands. Oh my, I didn't see this one coming. What are we going to do? I, I just I can't believe God knows it. Now, we're going to get into something that, that 
may make some people uncomfortable, but I believe in foreknowledge and predestination. And, and, and I'm not going to get into the, to the argument of, of Calvinism and that, but I just want to want to say I, I believe that because Paul tells it. And he said, all the things work together for the good of those. And he says, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined. Now, what he's talking about for those he foreknew, that's the ones that he knew were going to be saved. And we're going to get into this discussion. Well, if he knows who's going to be saved and who's not, and, and, and you know, God knows that I don't. I'm not God. He didn't let me in on that. He didn't ask me to be on that committee. All I'm knowing is he knew that at that time in Stigler, Oklahoma, several years ago at that Free Will Baptist uh, crusade, I was going to be there on a particular night, and his word was going to pierce my heart, and I didn't really know what I was doing. All I knew was I didn't want to go and spend eternity in a sinner's hell. And it's taken me a whole lot of years since then to get my theology, my belief where it's at. But God knew that. God has that knowledge. Because who he foreknew, he predestined. He had these things set into place. He predestined, and being predestined, predestined, he conformed us to the image of his son. Now, there, there is a interesting word study that that is done when we look at image and one of the words there's three words for it one, greek words one of them is the word icon is the word icon so we see with that that icon is representative of something we are formed in his image we are an icon we are not a mirror of him but we are a representative of him because he predestined us because he foreknew us but to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, those he predestined, he called, whom he called, these he also justified, who he justified, he also glorified. Wow, that's a bunch of those five words, isn't it? That just, I made that up. But, but I want you to see that's reason for us to Rejoice When we start looking at this, what, what is there that we can rejoice about that no separation? What is it that he gives us that we can rejoice about? Number one, he foreknew. He knows your name. He knows your, your name is written in a book. It's either written in the book of life or the Lamb's book of life, sealed in the Lamb's book of life. But your name is written down. God knows you. And, and human knowledge is after the fact God's knowledge has no limitation no timeline to it but I want you to see secondly he goes on in verse 29 and he doesn't just say his wisdom he foreknew us but because of his will he predestined us his will predestination has to do with the ultimate destiny of a child of God. Not the unsaved, but a child of God. God's intention for every lost person is clear. But God has an intention for every saved person as well. I go back and think, I'm definitely not Jewish. But because, because Jesus died for all, he gave the opportunity that whosoever believes in him, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord, I am that whosoever. Amen. You are that whosoever also. I love that song. Whosoever surely meaneth me. Surely meaneth me. Whosoever surely meaneth me. I remember the first time I heard that song. Stuart, it was up to the Free Will Baptist Church in Stigler, Oklahoma. Matter of fact, we sang it in Bernice Baxter's Sunday School class. That's where I learned that song, and I loved it, and I have never forgotten it. God has a will for all of us, and his intention is for all of us to be subject to that will. His wisdom, 
his will, and then thirdly, his word. Verse 30, he says, he called. Those he foreknew, he predestined. Those he predestined, he called. God issues a call for all of us. You can look at 1 Timothy 4.10 and see where Paul even writes to Timothy about that. Remember, Falls Creek, Oklahoma, hearing that call of God, not knowing what he wanted to do, not having the foggiest idea of what he wanted to do. Finally, had a pastor that I could counsel with, and he said, well, I've always found starting the youth department because you're going to know real quick whether you're cut out for ministry or not. And I started out, Bryce, of all things, seventh and eighth grade boys. There was about 12 or 13 of them. Had a blast. Had a blast. A couple years later, God changed that call and moved it to pastoral ministry. And then God made that call to OBU, to finish my education that was there. And then God moved us in the various places. And do you realize it took God 31 years, 30 years to get me prepared to come to preach and pastor at Lee Choir Baptist Church? That's where his will, his call has led me. That's me, though. What's your story? Now, let me tell you, along the way, I got a lot of stories I can tell that's not always been easy. And I haven't always been obedient. And there, there, there's many others that are there. But I can tell you, God's presence has never left me. Never left me. Because he knew me, he predestined me, he called me, and because of his, his work, what do I mean by his work? He justified me. He prepared me. He justified. He made me. He, he took my sins away so that I could be the pastor that I needed to be, that I could be the husband I need to be, that I can be the father that I need to be, but basically that I could be the believer that I need to be. He justified me for those. Being justified is an act God himself does, making us not guilty. I just want to picture the court where the judge looks at the jury and says, have you reached a verdict? And they say, yes, your honor, we have. What find ye? And the, the jury says, we find the defendant not guilty. And the judge goes, not guilty, and slams the gavel down. Case dismissed. Satan wants to accuse us. Satan wants to condemn us. Satan wants to convince us we are not worthy of God's love. We are not worthy of Jesus. And he's right. We're not. But through the death, burial, and resurrection and ascension of Jesus, he justified us. And God said, not guilty. Amen. We're not guilty. How many other people? How many people have you ever wronged and they could not forgive you? How many people have wronged you and you said, I will never forgive them? How, how, how do you get over the hurt that is there? And I want to look at people and I want to say, how does God get over the hurt that you caused him to sacrifice his son for you? Well, I'm not a bad person, preacher. I, I haven't done any of the big sins, but the fact is, you sin. See, God doesn't look at it in sizes, in measurements. It's sin. And the Bible says, all have sin. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Being justified means we don't get what we deserve because we are justified. He knew us, he predestined us, he called us, he justified us, and one more thing, he glorified us. We can rejoice because of his wealth. He glorified us. These he also glorified, verse 30. Paul said our glorification has already take, taken place. What he means is is that the promise is irrevocably certain. You can't change it. 
can't change it. I've had the opportunity in many years of ministry of visiting with teenagers that hear of the unpardonable sin and they are concerned, worried, scared that they have committed the unpardonable sin. To which, after I go through an explanation of reassurance of salvation, go through some of the no separation passages, I say, but let me tell you the biggest evidence that you have that you have not committed the unpardonable sin is the very fact that you're asking about committing the unpardonable sin. Because if you had committed that sin, you wouldn't give a rip, flip, or a dip about God anymore. Yes, what you did, you may have sinned. Probably did, actually. But you've asked for forgiveness. And because God knew you, predestined you, He called you, He justified you, you're going to be glorified. Once you've been put in that hand, nothing can take you out of it. I don't know about you, but reading those, it makes me almost want to jump and say hallelujah. Then somebody called me back to Costal. We can rest in his promise. We can rest in his plan. But we can also rest in God's protection. What can separate us? What yet in all these things were more than conquerors? What shall we say to these things in verse 31? If God is for us, who can be against us? What does no separation really mean? Number one, there's no accusation. What? What can we say to these things? If God is for us, then who can be against us? Verse 31 and following. He did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It's Christ who died. And furthermore, is risen. Who is even at the right hand of God who makes intercession for us. We have no accusation because of what Christ did for us. If God's for it, what's bigger than God? I like asking teenagers this one also. What's bigger than God? Ask kids, what's bigger than God? You know, they always come up with a question. Can God make a rock so big that he can't move it? To which I ask back, why would he want to? He's God. He doesn't have to prove anything. Anything. And what can separate us from the one who gave the price to be paid for our salvation? All Satan can do is make accusations, but Jesus is there saying, no, 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 you don't understand. I died. I died, was put in the grave, rose three days later, ascended right here in front of you now. You couldn't stop me, and you can't have him. Because of, the, because of the belief that he has, because of the confession that he's made, because his name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, you have no bearing on this at all. And we need to see that. There is no accusation. But Satan does, as I just mentioned, he makes the accusation to you. You're not worth it. You're not worthy. Oh, look what you did. You call yourself a Christian, and you did this. You know, there's been some great men, great men through history, but they will acknowledge their faults also. No one will say, I'm good enough, I did it on my own, because they can't. Because they cannot. So we see that, that with this, there is no accusation, but not only that, there's no desperation. What do I mean by desperation? Look at 35, 36, and 37. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, 
famine, nakedness, peril, or sword. Now, as, as Paul's writing all of this down, you have to understand, this is the very thing that believers were going through. This is the very thing that, that, that believers were subjected to, yes, by some of the Jews, yes, by the Romans, absolutely, by the Roman guards, soldiers, by the, the, the Roman emperor himself. Yes, when you read over in, in Hebrews with Faith's Hall of Fame and you get to the end of that and you hear about the ones that were naked wandering around in the desert that were boiled in oil, that were sawn, sawn in two. Yes, he's saying, who's going to separate us from the love of Christ? If they are to do, why were they persecuting like this? Trying to get the people to denounce. And they refused. And it caused them to be separated from their families. It caused them excruciating pain. It caused them even death. But Paul is saying, and, and so I want you to know when Paul's writing this, the Romans knew exactly what Paul was talking about because they probably witnessed it on a daily basis from those that were around. He said, what's going to separate us? All these things? Don't you remember what, what the psalmist wrote? We're killed all day long. We're counted as sheep for the slaughter. But even in this, yet in all these things, we are conquerors through him who loved us. Do you see the theme of Jesus just over and over and over and over again? In Christ, in Christ, in Christ. And that's got to be where our foundation is at. If we build our foundation on anything else, we're going to crumble. We're going to fall. But he's going on and says, what can, can, can separate nothing? And all these things were more than conquerors. I am persuaded. And he goes on and tells us these things. That are the, so there's no desperation. You don't need to be excited. You don't need to be anxious. Even if these things come, you see, we put our, our emphasis, we put our attitude, we put everything in the wrong area. Everything we have here is temporal. It's temporal. We may live to be 40, 50, 60, 100 years old, but the fact of the matter is we're still going to die. Jacob lived to be 140 years old. His dad lived to be 170 years old. Abraham lived to be 170 years old. But for what? what they still died and we have to remember this is not our home Paul tells us in Corinthians we're only ambassadors and an ambassador is a foreigner living in a in a country in a place but he's representing something else I love that we have a home in heaven and we are here in our on earth representing God but that's not where we're from and that's not where we're going back to ambassadors are called back ambassadors are fired sometimes as an ambassador here I won't be fired but I will be called back I will be called back so we see with that there's no desperation there's no anxiety for me. And, I, and again, Paul said it, absent in the body is present with the Lord. Hey, if I'm not here, I'm up there. And if I'm up there, you don't even need to worry about me. I'm going to be having the time of my afterlife, my eternal life. But then one more thing. There's no accusation, desperation. There is no isolation. Paul says, verse 39, or excuse me, verse 38, I am persuaded that neither life or death Angels or principalities, things present, things to come, height, depth, any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Now, just like we started this with we know all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord, called according to his purpose. Only Christians are going to understand this. It's not the bad things. It's the outcome that's there. When you look at this verse, the very end gives you the answer to that. Neither any of these things can separate us. It does not say separate us from the world. 
but separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Think about that a minute. Will God ever quit loving you? Will you ever quit loving a child? Can you ever quit loving a child? The love of Christ or love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Every time I read that, it, 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 it still, I can't fathom it. How could God love me? And he goes on, or, or, or he says with that, death, life, angels, principalities, powers, present, to come, height, depth, any other created, nothing. Do you get that? Nothing. Once you're there, you are, as he wrote in Ephesians, sealed. Sealed. You know the thing about a document that was sealed? It could that seal could only be broken by someone who was worthy. In Revelation, it was the Lamb of God. When you when you look at it, um, if, if if it's someone that is sold into slavery because of a debt that they owed, that seal was put on a document, and only the redeeming family member could open that. And I, I love that because we have been sealed by God and only God or Jesus, only they can break that seal. But it can only be broken when? When you're redeemed. And that redemption will come. Yes, I've been redeemed, but I will have that glorified body one day when that seal is broken. Isn't that awesome? No separation. No cancellation. No condemnation. Why? Two words. In Christ. But you have to be in Christ. Let's pray. Father, thanks for tonight. Thanks for this time of study. Thank you for all that you've done for us. We are so unworthy. There's none of us that are righteous. Your word says, no, not one. Old Testament, New Testament, both. But yet we are found righteous because of what your son has done. And we thank you for that. May we not just believe it. God, now let us live it. Forgive us where we failed you. In your name we pray. Amen. I got you up 10 minutes early. <laughs> <laughs>